tonight. Um, I'd like everybody to please put their cell phones on extra loud because my father, my late father, would love it. And tonight, um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny sitting or standing in this perspective because death, as many of us know firsthand, unfortunately, but that's that's the way it is. Some of us who are kind of removed from it have like this this trepidation about it, and. Um, one of my mom's friends is a very sophisticated, worldly woman in her, in her uh, 80s. She came over to me to comfort me during the shiver and she said, I'm, 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 I'm so sorry, Sarah, please. And she was really broken up. And she said, I'm, I'm just so sorry. And I said, Fran, thank you so much, but the deal is you're born, you live, and you die. And my father had an amazing, amazing life. Yeah, it was it was it was it was, not, it was a bracha to see the way he lived. That's the deal. And she said, "Well, Scott, the deal." I don't want to say. That. <laughs> and I was taken back when she said this to me. I said, "I said, well, if you can show me a better deal, I'm in me." Um, but I'd like to thank you all for joining my family and myself tonight. Um, I'd like to thank so many of you who have contacted us and. and gave us your condolences and your support in any way that was possible, in every way that was possible. Um, that's one of the powerful things about living where we live, um, in the land here and living in the community that we live in. Uh, I'd like to thank also everybody who helped me arrange tonight. Um, Heidi, of course, uh, my children, Rabbi Pear, Yona, thank you so much for everything. Um, and anyone else who I'm not going to mention who's been involved tonight, can thank you also for everything. Um, you know, it's a bit surreal when you lose your parents as a child, and as a child being 60, year old, 60 years old, it's, it's, it's really weird. Um, you know, it's the kind of thing that most of us, when you reach a certain level of consciousness, you think it's never going to happen. You know, just, it's just going to keep on going on and on and on, and then all of a sudden the music stops. And, um, say this with all sincerity, every bone in my body truly knows how fortunate I am. For one thing, to have my parents for so many years, to have them for so many years in such great health. Um, my mom now, who's still with us, who's 87, Lena and her, she's, she's unbelievable. She's vibrant, she's healthy. She's still telling me how to dress and how to raise my kids and how to live my life, etc. But that's okay, because I know when she stops saying those things. He was also an intensely committed family man. And this was his soft spot. And we knew how to milk it as children. And thank God we knew how to feed it and nurture it as we got older. Um, most happily, I feel that this has been infused in my life as a husband and as a father and as a friend to other people. Um, it's an amazing thing to go through someone's personal papers after they leave this world. Um, someone who you really believe you knew very intimately, like a parent. And you're going through their paperwork, and you see things about them, both, most of well, they were all positive. But I never realized that he was such a, 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 a he did such ba, a, a bal chesed. It was, it was an amazing thing. I saw all these receipts from these crazy organizations, you know, like one after another. And I said to my mother, I said, I've got a box of, of receipts from just this year. What is this? She goes, oh, your father was a Meshuggah. I said, I, said well, well, I mean, what is this? He goes, anyone who came to him for, for, for charity, for Sadaka, he gave. It didn't matter what it was, he gave. You know, if it was $5, if it was $500, he just wanted to give. And he felt that was that. I said, I didn't know this about him. He said he was crazy. There's a quick story. When we first moved here, we went to the hotel, and he, uh, he had the first fellow who came up to ask for Sadaka, he gave him a $100 bill, because he had $100 to give. So he gave one guy a $100 bill. All of a sudden, it was like SMS all over the coat. About 6,000 people were, were on him like flies on honey. And I said, Dad, you're supposed to give 100 guys $1. Not one guy, $100. Uh, he learned. Um, I was also reminded how involved my father was professionally when I was going through his papers. Um, he was one of the founders and the pioneers in our profession, the chiropractic profession in the United States. And he spent a grueling amount of time writing what he saw as a wrong or an injustice against people who could not get health care, chiropractic care specifically. Um, 
he's so strong for his conviction that he actually was arrested for practicing medicine in the 60s. You know, the charges were dropped later, but that's what organized medicine was doing. If you weren't practicing as a medical doctor and you were providing health care, they put you away. Um, an interesting sidebar is when I first started davening with Shia Hadash, um, I came up for an aliyah and I was at the Sefer Torah and I saw on the handles of the Sefer Torah an inscription and it said, donated by Robert Abrams and family. And I looked at it and this was, I knew that the former borough president and a former attorney general of the United States, his name was Robert Abrams, but I said, Rabbi, do you know who this person is? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, I know him. I said, really? How, how do you know him? And he goes, he's my father-in-law. And I got down on one knee and I genuflexed and I kissed Ian's ring. I said, he was a deity in my house. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, in the 60s, there was no licensure in the state of chiropractic, in the state of New York for chiropractic. And my dad, once a week for three years, would drive up to Albany with Bob Abrams. <coughs> And the way he knew Bob Abrams, Robert Abrams, was Robert Abrams' parents were patients of my mom, of my father's in the Bronx. And when we needed legislation to become licensed, he spoke to Bob, and Bob said, absolutely, I'll go up there and I'll lobby with you. And they spent literally three years driving once a week in my father's Volkswagen bug from Long Island into the, I, I guess, where was Bob living? In Manhattan or whatever. And then they would go up to the three hours to Albany, three hours back once a week. Unfortunately, it was very successful, but in my home, we had, my father was, was a polytheistic Jew. There was Hashem and Bob Abrams. You know, Bob Abrams was a deity, and we had a picture of him, really, this is a true story. We had a picture of him in my dad's office, and when I told my dad, you're not going to believe this story, he, he believed it, fortunately. Um, but needless to say, The purpose of tonight is to have some of you who didn't know my father to get the vibe of, of who he was and what he was about and the kind of person he was. And, um, you know, we had Pasha Shavuot, Bayachi, Yaakov lived. And the amazing thing is about the Pasha is a lot about death. You have Yaakov dying, you have <coughs> Yosef dying, but Yaakov lived. And it was amazing because. My late father's not here any longer. But um, he really lived. He really lived. Um, and I really hope that after tonight you get a little, a little taste of who he is and who, who he was. And, um, and you'll realize why, thank, how, why I am so thankful um, for being his son. Um, Rabbi Per. Please. Uh, there are a few handouts. Um, that not enough for everyone, but if you do get one, uh, you can share with the people next to you. I want to say, Scott. Uh, Three minutes. Three minutes. Fifteen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can cut it down. Um, you know, when I mentioned, I was very happy to tell my father-in-law um, after this story you just mentioned, because most of the times when I told people about your father, Martin Lawrence, you know, everyone assumed that there was a black stand-up comic who was, you know, visiting uh, Sheikh Hadash. But when I told my father-in-law, he knew in an instant that he had such huge smile, he was always excited if ever their trips would coincide to so get a chance uh, to see one another. Um, I thought, uh, as is customary, we do a little learning of Mishnayot uh, in commemoration um, uh, of your father. Um, and when I was trying to figure out which Mishnah, which Mishnah, Mishnayot we should learn, um, I, I came across the fourth and fifth chapter. I'm not going to learn all fourth and fifth chapter of, of the Gemara and Gittin. Um, and there were three reasons why I thought of this. Uh, first of all, um, I think one of the things that makes losing a parent, I imagine, so difficult is because they represent such consistency and such constancy in our lives. I mean, they're the only ones who are always there. There might be a younger sibling, but they weren't always there. And there might be friends, but you don't always have friends. They come in and out of your lives. But our parents are always in our lives. They're fully consistent. They're fully, fully constant. And part of the halacha, I think, tries to give voice to losing that absolute consistency um, that we've always had. 
Um, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why we say Kaddish for a year. It's to do something again and again and again to give voice to this idea uh, that I've lost something that's been so much a part of my life and, and certainly I know from your relationship that it, you were always so close. Even when you were far away, you were incredibly close. And had, he always had such a, a beam in his eye whenever he saw you. He was so proud of you um, and had such love and support and friendship. It's not always, you know, parents and children can have lots of love, uh, but not always friendship. And, and that's one of the things uh, that, I, that I saw. Um, and so I thought perhaps uh, we should talk a little bit about Dafyomi, because one of the things that Scott um, Scott did a few years back, and uh, Dafyomi is this incredibly, incredible commitment to consistency. It's this idea, and you learn for an hour a day, um, which is not so much, but you know what? Over seven years, you've gone through the entire Talmud, um, and that's something that not many people have done in their lives. And yet, if you commit a little bit every day, you make a big difference. That's what a parent is, of course. A parent is always there. You know, it's not one day that they create a child. It's a lifetime of constantly always being there. And I noticed one of them, I was going to try to time it uh, as I was watching. I saw that one of the uh, pictures uh, was your father visiting, I think it's the Berlin Holocaust Memorial. And I, if I remember correctly, there's something like 2,700 and something stones, which actually happens to be, the, and the, the artist was asked why he did that. And he said, I don't know, I just randomly picked the number. But it happens to be the number of pages uh, in the entire Gemara. Um, and so, got me thinking that perhaps Dafyomi is a way of thinking about consistency, and it happens to be that the, the Masechus, the fact that we're learning now, is getting. So that's the first stage. Uh, the second reason I picked about it, this is a little bit of a stretch, but you mentioned your father being a chiropractor. Um, the Hebrew word uh, for an adjustment um, is tikkun. Um, and uh, this is where the stretch and the groaning can begin. Um, <laughs> the fourth and fifth chapter is really the most exciting part of all of the second Gittin, um, and it's all about the concept of tikkun olam, right? So I figure there's some, some. It's a stretch, but there's there's some relevancy there. Um, but it does, of course, tikkun olam has to do with our relationships with other people, and I thought therefore quite appropriate uh, for your father. So I just thought maybe just to look at a few uh, of the um, when we think of tikkun olam, we think of these grand, beautiful ideas about relationships between people. But the way the the rabbis and the mission understood it is these were sort of technical ways of making sure that the law was not only uh, just, but it had the, the, proper, the proper results. Um, so for those of you who have the source sheets, uh, you can look. Um, there's a third reason as well, I'll get to it in a moment. Uh, you can look at some of the, the sources of Tikkun Olam. There's a case, for example, uh, on the upper left-hand corner, where a, uh, a man wants to divorce his wife. We don't usually think of this as an overly uh, romantic experience, but there's an incredibly uh, powerful lesson there. A man wants to divorce his wife, um, and he sends a messenger to send the get, um, and then the halacha is that he's allowed to decide to cancel the get. Um, the problem is if he's already sent the representative, it's possible that she will have received the get, um, and he might have canceled it, but she doesn't know that he's canceled it. And so the rabbi say, that's fine. However, we're concerned that what might come of this is that she may now get married again, and she will have now, you know, if they have children in the second marriage, they may create a mom's heir. Or maybe she won't get married again because she's afraid that maybe he's canceling it, and therefore she will remain unmarried, she will remain an agna. And so the rabbis say, because of these concerns, we make tikkun alam, we cancel that halacha, we say, no, you can't send a shaliach in the same way that it was originally described. Um, there are other examples, if you look on the, uh, the right-hand side, um, top right-hand side, uh, the, the third one, one who is a half-slave and a half-free man, he should serve his master one day, and he works for himself for one day, because he's a, he's a free man half the time, and he is a slave half the time. So he, that's how he should do that, says Beit Hillel. Now normally we're accustomed to Beit Hillel winning the day, but in this instance, actually, Beit Shammai carries the day. So Beit Hillel says he should work half and half. Beit Shammai comes along and says, wait a second, if you do this, you've solved the master's problem. So he's not oppressing his slave because he's only having him work one day a week. But you haven't really solved the problem for this slave because a slave, even if he's a half a slave, is not allowed to get married um, to a non-slave. So what's going to happen in this instance? He'll never get married, he'll never have children, and he's actually stuck in this type of limbo. So therefore, mipnei tikkun alam, 
the rabbis say, we follow the halacha of Beit Shammai, and we say that he uh, becomes, he buys himself out, so to speak, and he becomes fully free in, in order to do so. Um, if you look on the bottom left, there's an instance uh, about ransoming captives. It says, be careful of ransoming captives for large amounts of money, because what will happen is then, of course, people will take much more uh, uh, people captive, and it creates a problem for the community. But more than that, if you ransom a captive, especially let's say now we're talking about the case of a slave, it's possible that the person knows that he's going to get a lot of income from doing this, or the owner of that slave becomes very uh, upset that he's lost a slave, um, let's say in the case of a slave running away, you're not allowed to help a slave run away, now you think, why not? That's a great thing, right? We should support freeing slaves. But the concern is if you support a slave running away and you pay for him and take care of him and everything like that, one of the problems you then will have, uh, one of the problems that you will then have, oh, uh, uh, one of the problems that you will then have if you support a slave in this regard uh, is you then have the, the problem of that the owner of slaves who had not yet escaped, all of those individuals uh, might now be treated much worse, that many of those individuals will be abused as a result. So if you make tikkun alum, you don't allow to do that. In any event, there's a number of uh, other instances that you could go on and on. Um, the, the, the question is, what's the relationship of all these sources of mipnei tikkun alum? Just a connection to uh, Scott. I know that he loves skiing. He once had uh, the Attorney General of Utah in this shul. I, I think you got a chance to meet him. Uh, his chair broke while he was sitting, and we were not sued by the Attorney General of, of Utah. So I figure if we made it past that, we'll, we'll make it past this, this as well. Um, so what's the connection of all these ideas of the Dei Tikkun Olam? Um, we often think of it as this grand, great, spectacular idea, uh, but I think it's actually a much more modest idea. And the idea is beware of unintended consequences. That you think, for example, you want to rescue a slave, you're going to make everything better. But what might ha actually happen? You end up making things worse because the person who lost the slave now oppresses everyone else. So you have to be careful of your actions. You have to be aware that your actions have consequences. It's not just enough to have the right intentions, but you must also have the, the right actual um, uh, results. Um, and I think that's related to the second idea um, that I'm talking about in terms of when we commemorate uh, a parent, um, that we need to realize that a parent has the ability uh, to put us out in the world, and they have no idea necessarily what we're going to do with our lives. Uh, but we have to be aware of that relationship. And that's the third reason. So if you turn the page, on the, the second page, um, the rabbis in chapter 5 introduce you to a concept of darche shalom, uh, which is, uh, interesting enough, tikkun olam is mostly relations between Jews. Uh, we think of tikkun olam as how we're supposed to relate to the non-Jewish world. By and large, almost all the sources of tikkun olam are how we relate to other Jews. They're mostly financial or status questions along those lines that I just spoke about. Divorce, slavery, things along those, not necessarily overly romantic ideas. Darche shalom is how you're supposed to relate uh, very often to the non-Jewish world. Um, and for those of you who have the source sheets, you can see there, there's some nice ideas about, you know, for example, you're not allowed to help a, uh, a, a Jew violate halakha. Um, let's say Shemitah, you can't help them violate the halakha that. With a non-Jew, you can help a non-Jew uh, violate Shemitah. They're not involved in, in Shemitah. Um, you're allowed to ask them, how are they doing, even as they're violating a concept for us, because Darche Shalom, you should show uh, concern for, for other people. Um, certainly is reflective of, of your father's life. Um, but it's the first uh, thing which you see on the bottom of the left-hand side that I thought to bring this text. These are the things that they said you should, uh, they enacted due to the ways of peace. A Kohen should read the Torah first, and after him a Levite, and after him an Israelite, because these are the ways of peace. Um, the rabbis were concerned that there's peace in Shul. I'm not sure if this is the only suggestion I would have offered, um, but they thought this is one of the ways, that always have a Kohen go first, always have a Levi go second, as a Levi, as a son of a Levi. Um, I thought this was relevant. The question is, people are often bothered by this idea of 
Why should you have a levy uh, go first or go second? Why? That seems the opposite of creating peace, right? Why do we prejudice and say that these people are more important than other people? Um, and I'm reminded of, of, of this teaching, uh, which I think is very important to remember. Um, the reason why the, the levy goes second and the Kohen goes first is nothing to do with them. It has to do with something that they're great Great, 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 great father. When Moshe comes down from Har Sinai and he sees everyone violating and engaged in idol worship, um, Moshe says, whoever is on God's side, come be with me. And all the Levi'im come over and are with Moshe at that point in time. And we honor the, 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 the Levi'im with the second Aliyah, the Kohanim, were part of that same family because of something that their, their ancestors did. So it's not we're honoring them out of the blue. We're honoring them to honor meritocracy. That something someone did 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, still has an impact today. And, and that's why we honor, honor a baby. And indeed, that's, I think, uh, what you're doing tonight as well. Um, the idea is that something your ancestors did is still having an impact right now in our lives. Um, and of course, when you gather people together to think about your father, you're bringing him into life. I, I spoke about the law of unintended consequences, which we usually view as a negative. They can also be a positive. That we have to be aware of the unintended consequences of the way our parents live their lives. They affect us, and the way we live our lives will affect others going down for many generations to come. So, I, oh, so I would like to uh, undo what Scott said and actually thank Billy. Because if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't have my teeth in my mouth right now. So that would make it really hard to talk, so thanks. Um, I was thinking, because of the nature of what Scott asked and how to talk about what life is all about. So the, I was in Finland last week, and I was in the middle of a very intense business meeting with these people. And the only thing I could eat was fish. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the meal, I thought, oh my gosh, I got a fish bone in my throat. And my first thought was, like, oh, this is going to be a horribly embarrassing place to die. And it's like, I can't die here in the middle of this meal. How would I ever explain it? And so I was, you know, like really flipped out. Thank God, obviously, I didn't die. I was able to make it back. And uh, I open up the Gemara right where I left off. And it's the Gemara in Titus. And the Gemara says there that any death which is not in a person's deathbed is called an unusual death. I thought, wow, isn't that amazing? Because now it's the Shloshim, and you've asked me to speak a few words. And one of the things, obviously, in the Parsha, how it ties in with uh, Yaakov, it's the classic matriar uh, patriarch's lying on his deathbed, calling together his family, has this amazing, amazing gift of having everybody that's with him. And when you look at it, it's even more amazing. The two primary Parshas in the Torah that talk about death both use the title of life. It's Chayi Sarah, and it's Vayichi. It's not the death of Sarah or the death of Yaakov, it's their lives. And not only that, to make it even more complicated and sort of bizarre, the Gemara also in Tainus says that Yaakov didn't die, right? Which is kind of really hard to understand because clearly we read in the Parsha that Yaakov was embalmed. And maybe this is where the term mummy comes from because if you embalm a living person, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I mean, clearly he was dead, right? So how could the Torah say that Yaakov didn't die if he's embalmed? The Malbim jumps on there right away and says, how can you embalm him at all? Because we know that we allow the Jewish body to return to the earth. It has to decompose. And the answer is because Yaakov was so saintly, he was so holy, that when Yaakov's soul left his body, there was no soul left in the body. And the only reason the body needs to decompose is because if we don't do our work while we are alive, the soul is knotted, it's trapped with the body, and therefore it can only be released once the body's no longer there to hold it. But there was no problem by Yaakov, because Yaakov had completely left. But the morale takes it a step further. The morale says that there was no dying, there was no death in Yaakov's dying. 
Meaning, it's almost like if I had to explain them around my own language, which is probably dangerous to do, but I would say, it's like the, you know, the guy woke up one day, and he goes over to the door to open the door, and his arm goes through the door. He says, whoa, and he sees his body still in bed. I must have died. In other words, there was no transition to the death. His soul was as aware and conscious in the next world as it is in this world. This is the mezuzah. The mezuzah tells us that it's not about the departing, it's about the arriving. We put the mezuzah on the door to realize that we will leave this room, it's true, but we are entering somewhere even more spectacular. And this is what the Gemara also says by a lost object. An object is never lost, it's only lost from its owner. So therefore, when somebody dies, it only die in the sense that we lose that person, but not that person, that person's not lost. That person's an incredibly elevated, higher, more spectacular world than we could ever really imagine. The question is, how do we translate this? So coming back to this idea of what does it mean that Yaakov didn't die, Rav Simcha Wasserman, Zechon Bracha, once explained as follows. He said that when you look at the stars, you may see a brilliant star shining in the sky, but that star may have died millions of years ago. But to you, the star is still alive. It's still shining. You can point. You can see it. And so therefore, Yaakov may have passed away from this world thousands of years ago, but if you look around the room, you see that Yaakov is very alive because we are shining the light of Yaakov. Yaakov's light continues, therefore Yaakov lo met. And it's the same thing as well. You know, when we talk about people here who might not have ever had the merit to know your wonderful father, bless memory, there's a way that, he can, that people can know him. You know, there's a, a story they say, the Chafetz Chaim, that once there was a thief who came into the Chafetz Chaim's house, and the Chafetz Chaim went running after him, yelling, is there anything else that you need? You know, and, and then there was a story once the Chafetz Chaim was going to send a letter to America, and somebody said, oh, no problem, I'm going to America. But the Chafetz Chaim took off the stamp, and he, he ripped it up so that he wouldn't be stealing the one ruble or whatever from the government. And all these stories, and as they tell the story, somebody says to the other guy, come on, hello, hello, time out, reality check. Do you really believe these stories? And the guy says, no, I don't. But tell me something, why don't they say these stories about you? <laughs> so if we really want to understand who we are, sometimes the reflection of the light of that star that we make is the people we surround ourselves with. And I think that if anybody didn't know your father, all they need to do is look around the room this evening and see how many amazing people have come together to honor your father, and they will see your father. Because the light of your father shines through you, and through you shines the light to your family and to all of our community, and that's why it's Vayichi. The idea of dying is not a chiddish. Everybody will die. The question is, did you live? And when you lived, then you have life forever. <laughs> so there's a uh, there's a very very interesting rabbinic teaching in the Medrash Talmud. Don't worry, Scott, I'm good on time. Okay, <laughs> and it's actually a, a, a teaching from Parshat Shkalim, when God instructs Moses with the mitzvah of uh, the machasid shekel, that every single person, every member of the community is meant to participate in the mitzvah of bringing tzedakah in order to build a mishkan. And Moshe Rabbeinu says this medrash is concerned, and he says the following, he says, he says to Hashem, Mishani mates, when I pass away, ain't I need car. No one's going to remember me. Who's going to remember me? And Hashem says to Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, are you crazy? Every single time that they open a Sefer Torah and they read the words, Vayadabra Hashem Moshe Limor, the God spoke to, to Moses and said, every single time they learn Torah, it's going to be as if you, Moshe, are there with them, learning Torah together with them. So the P.S. to the Rebbe, the Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto, he asked a very serious question on this, on this, on this message. He says, what was Moshe Rabbeinu really worried about? Why was Moshe worried about his legacy, so to speak? And he says, and in a very powerful way, a very beautiful way, he says, it's actually a lesson about every single neshama that comes into this world. Every soul that comes into this world, when it leaves this world, when it departs in this world, it's concerned that what? Not so much that they'll be forgotten, 
But what are they concerned about? That they'll no longer be able to be involved, to be a part of the ma'asim, the various mitzvot that we have here in this realm. And that's what Moshe is concerned about. When I pass on, not, he's not worried about his legacy. He's saying to Hashem, I'm concerned that I'm going to miss what's going on here. So the Peter sets the Rebbe he says something unbelievable. He says the following. And he says this in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1940. So just to put it in the context. He says, Lachain, therefore, chutz min amirat kadish, the limerat mishnayot achare anitarim. He says, therefore, in addition, more than just saying Kaddish or learning Mishnah, as Rabbi Peres spoke about, that there's a custom to study Mishnah from the oral tradition because the word Mishnah contains the same letters as the word Neshama, soul, right? So he says, more than those two things, he says, Tova hi la Neshamot, gan kishezochrim otam be'et asiyat ha-mitzvah v'tal m'torah, lo zechira bilvad, rak kishinit kasher otam, Listen to this idea of this piece that's the back. It says, more than just having intellectual you know, cognition or recognition or recall of the person who's departed, what are we doing in those moments when we say we are going to dedicate learning or a particular mitzvah in, in the honor and the merit of a departed soul? What are we actually doing? We're enabling that neshama to join together with us in that mitzvah, to join together with us in that study of Torah. It's as if that the Shema is here together with us. So that's really the idea of, of everything we're trying to do this evening in terms of dedicating an evening of learning and of reflection in honor of Aliyat Neshama. It's not solely recall, but rather it's realizing that we're giving every mas, masatot, every good act that you're involved in, it's as if your father is there with you in that act. So I also wanted to share one quick idea um, that, I, that came at me this morning when we were reading the story of Ayechi Yaakov. We know that our sedra includes that poignant moment when Yaakov Avinu and Jacob, our forefather, turns to his beloved son Yosef and asks Yosef to make him a sacred oath, promising him what? That he will not be buried in Egypt. And how does Yosef answer him? Anochi esakidvarecha. So at first, at first glance, those words, I will do as your words, at first glance that seems like, okay, Yosef is just answering, sure dad, I've got you covered. But the Dats of Canaan, one of the commentators on the Chumash, says something very interesting. He says, what are those words, Anochi eschaki varecha, I will do as your words. Yosef is promising Yaakov that just as Yaakov wants to be buried in Egypt, not in Egypt, but in the land of Israel, so too Yosef promises his father at that point in moment when, when Yaakov is asking Yosef to promise him that he will bury Yaakov in Israel, he says, don't worry, Dad, I'm also going to be buried in Israel. So at first glance, it seems like a, a problematic exchange. Your father's giving you a, a last will and testament, so to speak, and at that moment you say, yeah, sure, Dad, I'm also going to be buried in the land of Israel. What's going on here? So... The Gemara Nido says something very powerful. He says, the, the, the Chachamim say there, the Gemara, that there are actually three partners in the creation of every single life. You have Hashem, obviously, right? You have the mother, and what does the mother give in terms of genetically to that, to that, to that baby that comes to the world? The mother gives flesh and blood and organs. But the father, what does the father give? He gives the atzamot, the bones, the skeletal structure of that child. And it's very interesting because Rabbi Moshe Wilson explains this Gemara to say something very powerful. When Yosef HaTzadik says to his father, don't worry, I'm going to leave the same instructions and I too want to be buried in the land of Israel, it's because, and if we know, if we look at the Torah itself, what does the Torah say? Yosef says to his brothers, what? Promise me when the time comes and the Jewish people come back to the land of Israel that you will take my atzamot, you will take my bones up from here. Specifically his bones, not my body, but my bones. And so our Chachamim understand this to suggest that Yosef understood that the bones, his bones, were not solely his bones, but they were the Hamshech. They were the continuation 
of his father. His father lived on in him and his skeletal structure, if you will. And therefore, when Yosef leaves the instruction to his brothers, promise me that my bones will make it up to the land of Israel, he sees this as the completion of his father's last will and testament. His father says, promise me I will be buried in the land of Israel. And Yosef understood that if his bones are the continuation of his father, his father lived on, so to speak, in his own skeletal structure, then he leaves the instructions that he too wants to be buried in the land of Israel. And I thought this muscle was particularly apropos when we're talking about commemorating um, you know, uh, 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 your, your beloved father himself a chiropractor and you a chiropractor and we should talk about the idea of, an, of, of our neshamot living on in the skeletal structure of our descendants and so my bracha to you and you, should, you and the entire family should find comfort, should find the chum in these two beautiful ideas that in every maaseh tov, in every good deed that you're involved in your father is joining as a partner in that deed and that as you continue to heal people and bring comfort to people's lives, realize that that's a hem sheikh, that's a continuation of all the work that your father did in his lifetime, and that Bezalel Hashem, knowing that your father lives on in your good deeds and in your all the healing that you do, that you should find comfort as well. God's friends. And it was great when he used to come to learn with us. He was right there with us. He, he wanted to just be there. So basically, for me, your father was a brother. So I want to talk about the brothers a little bit. You know, we, we, we started Shemot already this, this afternoon, but the brother thing doesn't end. So. Somebody last night in, uh, in, in Schultz, Cox, gave over a very beautiful thing. Uh, in paraphrase, his name is Ita Marmelet, when he said it over B'Shay Mamro. Anyway, you know, he says like this. Look at these, look at two psuki. So one is, everybody knows the story. Everybody knows the story, and the brothers Mamush hated, hated Yosef. And the brothers saw that the father loved them from all his brothers, whatever that means. But he snu all them, and they hated him. The lawyer shalom, and they couldn't speak any peace with him. They could not speak words of peace with him. So it's crazy. So now Yosef is living. He's going to live 39 years. And his brothers haven't spoken a word of peace with him. By right? 22 years he was there, and then 17 years after Yaakov comes. How do we know that? Because in today's parashah, Vayechi, when Yaakov leaves the world, you know, it's one thing, it's one thing when, when he revealed himself to them. So everything that they thought before about Yosef could be, could be taken away. Why? Because he always said, Elohim, 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 it's not me, I didn't do anything. So they understood, even though they wanted to kill him. They, they gave a psak din, the Gemara says. That they made a psak din, the Gemara says that they were going to kill him because he was a heretic. Because how could he have the chutzpah to say that he was having dreams? What does dreams mean? Dreams mean, you know, God is coming to you. Your father's alive. Your father Yaakov is alive. Our father's alive. He can't be having dreams. His brother, he must be a heretic. I have to get rid of him. He's going to take Ben Israel totally off the course that they're supposed to be in. And then, when he finally reveals himself to them because he feels that they're ready to hear it, still, the next 17 years, there's no real talk between them. There's nothing going on between them. Why? Because all the time, Yosef knows they're a little bit afraid, even though he keeps telling them, it's all Hashem, anything that happened. It's only God, it's not me. They're still a little bit afraid that when the day comes, they can have a chance, that he can have a chance to have his revenge. 
And he's going to do it. And he basically, the Torah says, what does he do when they come to him and they say that, you know, we're scared? He says, But you don't really have Yosef, I'll tear you. What happened right before that? I'm sorry, I skipped one, one plus I wanted to say. The exact same words again. But now it says, He cried. What is he crying about? What's he crying? He knows it's good. You're gonna, he's going to say something. Everything's gone. Why is he crying? He's crying because they're still afraid. They're still afraid. What's wrong with them? Didn't they see how much it was clear that I, I know it's not them? If it's not me, then it's for sure not them either. So just like I, everything I did, Yosef saying is from God, I know everything you did is from God. Don't worry about it. Why are you still crying? Why are you still worried? There's nothing to worry about. That's why you cry. Saying Lashon. So I was thinking one other thing. <coughs> Uh, on the, and I called you tomorrow tonight to tell him. You know, the fact that he uses the same Lashon and, 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 and they, 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 they couldn't speak to him, and now all of a sudden they could speak to him. What an opening that happened. Right? A long time ago, I couldn't speak to him. And then all of a sudden, years and years and years and years later, wow, now they could speak to me. Maybe that's why he cried. And this is all that I remember about a man who's another generation from us. And he just like broke, it, or broke down all the barriers. He could speak with anybody. Something special. So I, I bless you to, to hold on to that because you have that same beautiful trait in your whole family very approachable. And then, no, like everybody else said, what does Rabbi Nachman say that when a person leaves the world, what's interesting, a person leaving the world and a, and a, and a behemoth leaving the world? Behemoth leaves the world, it's over, gone, nothing. But Tzaddik leaves the world, he says, everything that he did is still alive. So every time anybody in your family does any mitzvah, it's him. He's getting all the credit. We don't get any credit in this world. The credit in this world is we get to do another mitzvah. The credit is gufa the mitzvah. But where's all the credit going? Something great's going on. It's going to your father. So, bless you to give him a lot of credit. Hey, hey. I haven't read this yet. This is from Kathy, Scott's sister. I will be Kathy will begin by saying how much I wanted to be here in the room with you tonight. <coughs> Honoring my father with my family, friends, and community by my side. Even though I am unable to be there physically. I do hope by sharing some words and feelings about my dad give you some further insight into how wonderful a man he was. My father was a giving man, and as a child I was on the receiving end of his boundless love and generosity. My dad worked very hard to provide for his family, but there was never a doubt in my mind that he was and would always be there for me and for his family. Regardless of what arose in my life, or what decisions I needed to make, my father was always present and supportive, period, full stop. He wasn't a showy man, so it came as an awakening when I began to learn about and understand his many accomplishments. He was an influential teacher, friend, and mentor to so many people, and I have witnessed an outpouring of affection for him that I just never comprehended. People liked him a lot. He was fair, funny, kind, honest. These are some of the words that keep coming up, and I knew this, sort of. But he was my dad, and our relationship was that of father and daughter. Maybe if I had not moved far from home 30 years ago, I would have seen this clearly. 
but because our time together had been limited to our daily phone calls and quick vacations, I never really looked at him or saw him as the man he was to the outside world. All I knew was the man from the relationship I had had with him, that of parent and child. But now I have learned about him in ways that I just couldn't see, and I am blessed in having this knowledge. People keep telling me how wonderful I am for having come to America to be with him at the end of his life but they have it all wrong. I have had the honor and privilege of caring for and loving him in the way that he always cared for and loved me, unfiltered. His life was filled with independence, dignity, and humanity, and that is what I witnessed to the very end. Thank you, Hashem, for the gift of my father. Yitzhak Mechel ben Yosef, May his memory forever be a blessing. Um, so much, so much happened in the last days of his life. And we were there 11 days, 12 days, like arrived there and that night hospice began. Not that it was planned that way. And what I'd like to share is that the day I arrived, between that hour and hospice, I really met my father-in-law for the first time. He was quiet, kept to himself, dignified, warm, and yet you couldn't get too close. And for me, that's what it's all about, is really getting close. He had been on medication, he was in extreme pain, sevens out of tens, and for him that was like probably way beyond ten out of ten. And so when he was awake, he came into the living room, lied on a couch, and he started to talk. And Kathy and my mother-in-law were sitting there as though, where did this come from? He hadn't been like this. And in fact, he had never in all the years, said things he said, according to my mother-in-law. <coughs> he wanted to speak, and it was in such a way that I could ask questions that I could not have asked before. And he was more than excited to answer. His energy was flying. He was funny. He really was a really <coughs> funny man. He knew how to play and have a good time, but this was different. This was free-flowing, as he said. Now it's from here, Heidi, to here. And I was like, great, Dad, just let it go. And so he did. And he was so lovable. And so you could see happy to be of that way. And it continued in a quieter way till he passed. But he gave, and he gave so much life, literally till that last breath that we were there for that it went to teach me, and I think all of us there, that his love was endless. He just wasn't sharing it in the way that um, he was educated differently. And when the last Shabbat was in, we were in his hospice room, designated in the house for him that we sat in constantly. It just called us in all the time, and we had some amazing I'd say divine meditations in there with him. He was just giving and giving. And he came out in the wheelchair, and we asked him if he could give us a blessing, and he could barely speak. But I was really up close, and I could hear that he said, I knew this event would be coming, and all I have to give is love. Before, um, when my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, I went down there, and um, he, was, he was great. You know, we went golfing. He was really, he was great. And um, we were having a coffee somewhere, and I said, listen, um, I need to ask you something. Maybe out of character. He said, what? I said, um, I'd like my inheritance now. <laughs> <laughs> What? 
He said, I'd like my inheritance now. And he was baffled. And I took out a notebook and I said, I want you to write what's important. And then he knew I really was crazy. <laughs> and he, so he goes, well, what are, you, what are you talking about? I said, listen, Dad, you know, this, this stuff, I got more stuff than you got. I don't need your stuff. I said, this is, this is, this is the stuff that I really want. What do you, what do you I want me to tell my grandchildren? What do you want me to tell your great-grandchildren? So he took the notebook, and in his uh, usual way, he put it in a pile of his things, and I was going back every three weeks uh, to Florida, um, and I came back three or four weeks later, I said, so where, where's my inheritance? And he goes, it's on the pile over there. <laughs> so I opened it up, and there was nothing on it. So I, <laughs> so I, I said, what, you know, what's up? He said, I don't have the koach. I just, I don't have the strength to write anything. My mind's everywhere. So I said, can I ask you some questions then? He said, yeah. So I, I just wanted to share a little video. This is, um, as a matter of fact, it's, it was quite funny because it was sukkahs and Asha and I were there and um, my parents never had a sukkah and I said, I need a sukkah. And they live in this pretty stuffy neighborhood. <laughs> and uh, so Asha and I you know, checked it out and said, we can make a kosher sukkah here, no problem. And then we the cup, there's two walls, we'll make a third wall, we'll, we'll do it, this is great. So we went to Home Depot at like, like 6.30 in the morning, we got there by 8 o'clock in the morning, my parents had a sukkah. And my mother never had a sukkah, my father never had a sukkah. They walked out and my mother says, this is so, I don't know the exact word, this is so great, can I invite my friends over? <laughs> I said, yeah, that's kind of the idea. <laughs> Definitely invite your friends over. Oh, wow. Well, needless to say, like three days later, they got a letter in the mail from the board of, you know, the co-op board, tearing it, it has to be down by a week. <laughs> no problem. I think, I think we can manage that, you know. But my mother says, if I want to keep it up, I'm going to keep it up long. I said, no, no, a week's long enough. <laughs> So we, this is this is sitting in the sukkah, and it's it's a recording of me asking them just a few <coughs> questions. And if you if you would please um, uh, indulge me to share this with you, please. Yeah. Well, try to make sure that any door that you walk out. The old philosopher, yeah. remember that? Uh, Song we had? I do. The old flag. <clears throat> never, never, never give up. This is about uh, five weeks, six weeks before he passed away. I know. So, Asha was asking you before about your mother, your father, things like that. Um, what kind of kid were you? You're a good kid? Rebellious? Troublemaker? What kind of kid were you? Yeah. I was a pretty good kid. Yeah, I I was a good kid because I had uh, I had some good allies. My mother, and my father. What does that mean? They were always on my side. Yeah. Yeah, I was the weak one. So therefore, everybody had to make sure that uh, I got the, the best cut of meat, the best this, the best that, because I was dramatic people as a child. How old were you when you had dramatic people? I had to be probably uh, just before I think before I went to public school. Yeah, oh, also as a little kid. A little kid, yeah. Oh, wow. yeah, a little kid. Yeah, I, I must have had uh, maybe chicken pox or me so from that kind of people. That's probably. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get in trouble for anything? I mean, like big trouble. Big trouble. Uh, yeah, big trouble. Big trouble. I think the worst thing I ever did was when I was a little kid, maybe six or eight years old. I mean, I never got a present. Never got a present. I'm so poor, we never got presents. How am I going to? Christmas, forget. <laughs> Make a long story short. Never got presents. Never get a, maybe we get a present on our, on our birthday. But I was going to the. Uh, Woolworths, and and I saw toys, little lead toy soldiers. I would take them. That was my big 
criminal. The big heist. Big heist. Uh huh. Heist. Uh, uh, Glad Soldier. Never got caught. Did he get caught? He didn't get caught. Excellent. If I got caught for anything bad, I, I probably forgot it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what kind of advice do you want me to give my kids? Uh, Give me some advice. I hate giving advice. <laughs> you hate giving advice? I hate giving yeah. advice. Do you like taking advice? I don't like taking it if it's well intentioned. Do you have any suggestions? What should I attempt to focus on? What's important? What's important to you? Forget about the advice. Well, I told you, yeah, or, you know, we discussed it. What's, what's important? Family is important. You talk about what, what's important? Family. Because without the family, you don't have any backup if you need it. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you don't have relations, a good relation with the family because you need it for backup because that's the way life should be. That's what the nature of life is. To take care of each other, to watch out for each other, understand each other's weaknesses and excuse them, forgive them for what they do that hurts you, you know? You gotta understand that uh, People are weak and sometimes to do things that they're sorry for later on. You're supposed to treat all your kids the same? Uh, you, I think uh, you're supposed to treat all your kids the same. Well, it depends upon age and, and, and conditions. Young adults. Young adults? Not like when they're six years old, when they're 15, 20, 25. Yeah, I would, say, I would, yeah, I would say you treat them pretty much the same. Mm -hmm and let them know if there's a way that you treat them differently, why you treat them differently. Like, you know, I uh, remember that famous conversation you had with Zoe, when she said to you, but Baba, you don't love me. You don't love me. He said, yeah, I do love you, but I don't like you. I don't like, like you. didn't say I don't like, I don't like her the same as I like so-and-so. Oh, okay, whatever. Next <laughs> door. <laughs> okay. Um, so with your experience, what takes precedent besides family, I understand. If I wanted to tell Gideon and say to Rasha or Zoe, focus on this. This is important. Is it getting good grades? Is it making a lot of money? Is it you know, what's, what's, when it gets down to it, brass tacks. Well, try to make sure that any door that you walk out of, you always have the ability to walk back in through that door. Mm -hmm. Never lock doors behind you so you don't have the ability to go back to that person for that situation because of your own anger or temperament or sense of being cheated or being wronged. But uh, you never know people that you think you'll never need because of what they did to you in the past, you may need their friendship or their acquaintances again. That's what they always be able to walk through that door again. Next thing what you should do. Try to plan for a future, a, long, a lifetime future, that is not only uh, economically secure, but also something that you like to do. And be selective. Don't be afraid to try something, and then if it doesn't work out, to stop and do something else. You can always admit that you were wrong and go back and do it when you're young. Because when you get older, you don't have that, that opportunity necessarily. But it's important that you should be happy in your work. Because then you'll last number one, you'll be successful, number two. Number three, you'll want to do it as long as you're physically up to it. It should make it very pleasant. What are you proud of that you've done in your life? Why am I? I'm proud of my family. That's what I'm proud of. Everything else is secondary. 
family, being proud of my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren. And that pride is based on 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 real, real down to earth characteristics. And no funny baloney. These are real characters, and real people who know how to live, know how to love, know how to have passion, know how to to to, uh, to be loyal, to be there when they're needed by other people that that, uh, that they uh, become involved with. So you know that's that's important to you, is that you uh, take care of yourself, make sure that you take care of the others if they need to be taken care of. Yeah. Many regrets? Regrets. Um, no, no regrets. I've been in a lot of places, done a lot of things, been through a lot of experiences, a lot of different Custodial, honor, honorary positions, no positions at all. I'm disappointed and frustrated. Been happy most of my life. So I'm, I'm okay. I have no regrets. Meanwhile, I, you know, now that I'm, I've been pretty ill. I've been very lucky, and then I'm able to see the quality of the children that I raised and have come back to me without me realizing that I had done such a good job. My mom had done such a good job. I got it to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any, um, that was cute. Good. Anything else? Anything you want to tell your grand, your great grandchild, my grandchild? What do you want to tell them about her? Gideon, Sage, and Josh, and Zoe's children. We were having made that. You were very lucky to be born into this family. With a grandfather like this, and a grandmother like Heidi, and aunts and uncles like you have, you have the most, the greatest opportunity to be successful, happy, and lead a good, honorable, and, and, uh, and uh, pious Jewish life. So you're lucky. I appreciate your luck by looking around and seeing what other people do or don't have. Thanks, Pop. Okay. looking at his watch already and he's tapping it. This is wondering why it's going so slow. But nonetheless, the last time I was together with uh, Reb uh, Yitzhak Michael Ben Yosef Halevi, I was giving him a treatment on his hands, as Haley remembered <laughs> this evening. And uh, he was intimating if uh, Scott or anybody else complains that you're speaking a little too long. <laughs> Don't worry, just give them a treatment on their hands and see what I'm going through and they'll be happy that you're just speaking and not giving them a treatment on their hands. But um, I remember saying to him at the time, what a privilege it was to be giving a treatment to the hands of somebody who was such a great healer himself. And um, both my parents were, my late parents were physicians, so I know the world of doctors a little bit. And interestingly enough, my father was a great healer. He had these powers where he could heal people just by talking to them, touching them. He birthed thousands and thousands and thousands of women with painless, uh, wide awake, natural childbirth, and many, many other amazing things. And I saw in Scott and his father, uh, an attribute of uh, doctors who had the ability to heal people. 
to really hear, not just write out a prescription and send them on the way to get a couple of pills. And Scott has taken care of myself and my family, uh, many, many of my sons, daughters, grandchildren. And uh, the, uh, the Lawrence family are amazing healers. And uh, this is part of the personality of the life that they have. They are able to share and give life to other people, a very, very big gift. And uh, I wanted to give a little bit of a word of Torah, should be an aliyah for the neshama of uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Michel ben Yosef Halevi. And it should be something that uh, should be remembered about him. And of course, it has to have something at least that deals with Yitzhak and something that deals with the Levi'im. We think people have mentioned already his connection to being a lady. Maybe the Levi'im people are helped. Anyway, to start with uh, Yitzhak, <clears throat> we know that at the time when uh, Yitzhak was born, so uh, Aram Avinu found himself in a bit of a pickle because uh, people said, what's this business over here? This man, Avraham, 100 years old, his wife uh, in her 90s, and uh, now they're coming and telling us that they had a child. They've had a child before. What's this business? Must be, the tongues were wagging, <coughs> that they went down to the market and they, you know, they bought a child. Yeah. Not their child. So now we had a very interesting thing happen. At the time when uh, uh, Yitzhak came to the, uh, a certain period in life, it says like this, this is in uh, Breshis, Perik Chaf Aleph Pasuk Chet. It says like this, Vayigdal Hayeled, the lad grew, the little boy grew, Vayigamal, Yigamal, something to do with uh, Yigamal, something to do with uh, being weaned. Okay? The Yas Avraham Mishte Gadol. Avraham made a great feast. Okay? The Yom Yigamel It Yitzchak, the day that Yitzchak was weaned. Now comes Rashi and gives an explanation. What I would like to do is to show how Rashi, Rashi has a methodology in his explanations, and it's a great thing to come to understand Shuto Shal Mikra, the simple meaning of the text, Aliba de Shitaso Shal Rashi, in accordance with the methodology of Rashi, there's a certain way of understanding the Psukim. So what does Rashi come here? Rashi has two small little comments. First of all, on the word Vayigamal, Okay? He says, L'sof chafdalet chodesh. This happened at the end of 24 months. That's what he has to say. End of 24 months. And then he comes to give a comment on Mishte Gadol, a big feast. And he says, Shayusham gedole hador. The uh, great personalities of the generation were there. Shein, Eder, Avimelech. Some people hold that Alvin Miller was actually a great tzaddik. The great people of the generations. And now Rashi has given both of these things of bombshells of commentaries. Now meanwhile, we don't see how uh, Avram has gotten himself out of the pickle of all the tongues that are wagging about uh, Yitzhak not being his child. Sarah has got a way out. The Midrashim explained to her. She said, listen. Uh, anybody who has a, uh, a baby here who's uh, breastfeeding, just bring them along and I'll feed them. Unless a woman has given birth to a child, hormonally she doesn't have uh, milk to give. So this proves at least that Sarah was the mother. Okay, good. But now people said, oh, wonderful. Now I've got a bigger, uh, a bigger complaint against Avram. Okay, Sarah was the mother. You know who the father is? Not yet, Sarah. It's Avi Melech, okay? But, somehow or another, 
Rashi has explained to us in these two little commentaries that he made to us all we need to know to understand how Avram was pulled out of the pickle. Let's look again. One thing is Vigamal, the Sof Kafdalet Chodesh, the end of 24 months. And the Mishnah Gadol, that there were the Gudolei Hador there. Not that he uh, found Alan Lurie to come and bring him uh, organic lamb shops from South Africa and this and that and the other thing. No. Not talking about the food, you know that uh, Tao doesn't talk about the quantity of food that was at uh, even when Achashverosh uh, uh, made his meal gigantic for hundreds of days, doesn't mention Mishte uh, Gadol. Okay, so now we have to try and understand what this, in this one little word, Vayigamal. What does Vigamal mean? It's explaining to us over here. Okay? Vigamal, if we look at it, we see Vigamal, and it doesn't say this, we can say with the, the help of the, uh, uh, the Gur Arye, other commentators, it doesn't say Vigamal. What's the difference between Vigamal and Vigamal? Vigamal means that he weaned himself. Yitzhak weaned himself. If it says Vigmol, it doesn't say Vigmol et Yitzchak. It says Vigmol et Yitzchak. It meant that somebody else had come along and had weaned him. Vigamal is what's known as the Nifal. We have intransitive and transitive. Vigamal, with a dagesh in the Gimel, is Nifal. It means that he weaned himself. Vigmol et would mean that somebody else weaned him. Ah, so now we see an interesting thing. We see this now from what was the 24 months that Rashi was telling us about, which he brings from the Gemara Ksuvos and Samach Amad Aleph and Gitin Ayn Hay Amad Beis, Ayn Gimel Amad Beis. What? A child, a little child, will nurse from its mother, but not more than 24 months. So when Rashi said, that he nursed until 24 months, he's telling us that what? That Yitzhak was the one who weaned himself. Okay, wonderful. Rashi had come. What do, we, uh, what do we understand now? We can see there's another famous example, a raya, a support for what happened over here. Another famous case of being weaned was the case when Chana weaned Shmuel. And over there, and it repeats it two or three or four times in the Pasuk, it says about Chana, the Gamal et Shmuel. She weaned Shmuel. Whenever you have a word, a verb, followed by an et, it means that it's a poor yotze. And this was in the cow, she weaned him. Whenever you have a poor, which is a poor yotze, in the cow, so in the Nifal, it's going to be a poil omed, going on the person himself. So we see here that Yitzhak weaned himself. Wonderful. What does this have to do now with uh, Avram getting out of trouble here with all the wagging tongues? So we see <coughs> there's another interesting place. We know a shita of Rashi and other great Mephorshim. When you have trouble understanding something in a puzzle, they've left you to, he's tapping his watch. I'm a customer, I am when you to I taught in universities and so on, and uh, my uh, students tapped their watches. I really wasn't troubled until they took out their diaries and began to turn the pages to see if the date hadn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is between um, pop, between Grandpa Lawrence and myself, and um, with one sitting there, you happy to be sitting here? I'm very happy. <laughs> yeah. well, we'll get there as quickly as we can. Amen. Okay. When uh, the time came that uh, Moshe had a problem with the people who were revolting against him, because they said, "Listen, Moshe is grabbing all the jobs here." Uh, that go to the Jewish people, giving them to his family. 
What's his business? Aaron Halevi, we're coming from the Levim now. Why is he getting the big jobs? Why not the other people? So Moshe said, you know what? Let's make a test. Let every leader of a tribe bring his staff. <coughs> we'll put it in oil aedut. And wait overnight, see what happens. What happened? Let's see if Hashem sends some special thing. The next day, Vayime Mochorat, the following day, Vayavor Moshe al Oral Aedut, came to Oral Aedut, Vinei Parach Mate Aaron, the staff of Aaron, which had flowered, right? Mate Aaron le Beit Levi, Vyotsei Perach, Vyotsei Tzitz, Vigmol Shkedi. So it's said, okay, that seems, you know, quite a big thing. All of a sudden, from a dry stick, <coughs> here things are flourish. So, Moshe, we know your tricks. You're the guy who's guarding oil aid. What did you do? In the middle of the night, you went, <coughs> you found a live tree, you cut a, <coughs> a branch from that, looks like a staff, and you made a quick switch. Except that what? Rashi comes to explain to us. When he says the word about Perach, he says, Yotzei Perach, he says, Kamash Ma'or. <coughs> like it sounds, which is what La Puke Lo Kamash Ma'or. What happens? Not that the flower fell off Yotzei, but the flower Yotzei, it blossomed. What about the tzitz? The tzitz was the bud. The bud came out. What about the, the last thing? Vigmal Shkedin. Vigmal Shkedin. What happened? All three of these things, normally you have the flowering, the flower falls off, the budding, the bud falls, and then you have the fruit. The miracle was that all three things happen at the same time. Now comes Rashi <coughs> and gives us a very in interesting, amazing explanation of what it meant by mol shkeding, when the almonds develop. Okay. When the fruit became recognizable, it was recognizable that they were almonds. Oh. Now comes Rashi to explain to us, to bring us a raya from somewhere else, what this thing is of Yigamon. Says Lashon Vaigdal Hayeled Vigamal. He brings us back to that original Pasuk that we saw at the time of Avraham. That what? What does this Vigamal mean? It means that the thing became identified. It was quite clearly identifiable. And he says, How do we know it meant that the almonds were identifiable? was that same word that was used earlier about Yitzhak meant that Yitzhak had become identifiable. And this was the whole thing that happened when Yitzhak was 24 months old. He said, Vigamal, he weaned himself. It meant that not only he weaned himself, but he had come to the situation and the stage of development where he was clearly identified as being the son of Avram. He looked two peas in a pod like Avram. Everything about him, his character, his behavior, <coughs> it was proven out. And that's why the Mishteh Gadol, why did Avraham bring the great people of the generation that they should be witnesses to the fact that this little child was indeed and the child of Avram, and not the child not purchased in the marketplace, and not the child Kasri Shalom of Adimim. In the same way I want to say <coughs> about Yitzhak Michal ben Yosef Levi and his son uh, Scott Zalman ben Yitzhak Michal Levi, that these were people who became identifiable in the world as very special people. Because well, Yitzhak wasn't just identifiable, oh well, he looks like his father. <coughs> he was identifiable as one of the great people created by Hashem in the history of the world. 
There's certain people who just go through life, they just run of the mill. And there's certain people who become identifiable as people who have been placed in the world by shame to do special things with special abilities. <coughs> Pop, Grandpa, as I used to call him, <coughs> he was one of these people, a person who was a healer, a person who had a pers uh, the individuality, the personality, the love, a very, very special person. And when I called Scott on the phone to be Menachem Avel <coughs> from Yerushalayim to, uh, to Florida, I said to him, Scott, you're privileged to have a father like that, and he's privileged to have a son like you. We should be, and we can see some of the privilege and the love and the respect and the honor that has been granted to Reb Yitzhak Michal Ben Yosef Halevi this evening. And may the words of Torah that have been said here this evening by the many people, the distinguished people who spoke with such love and uh, intelligence and Torah knowledge, should be an aliyah for his neshama, should be something that uh, his children, his sons, his daughter, his daughter-in-law, his grandchildren, should always remember and that he should be a, a living memory for them for all time. And through the Torah of tonight, for all time, and Scott should grow, his children should come to grow in Torah, and everybody here, and the communities that have been built by your rabbi and uh, other rabbis, who should have the merit to see the great leaders of the Jewish people come forth, we should merit to see the coming of the Mashiach and the rebuilding of the Beis HaMikdash speedily in our days. And may Scott and his family have a long life. Alan, just one word. One second more, please. I promise I'm not a rabbi, I won't be as long. <laughs> You're a South African. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, very, very quickly to uh, Francine, Mum, Peter, Scott, Abigail, boys, Heidi, Zoe. Wow. What a life you have to celebrate. We learned that in the finality, we can now start the celebration. Because basically, there's nothing else that we can do negative. Positive, yes, we could have. But negative, we can't go any further. So we certainly have an amazing life to celebrate. And the celebrations we had with your dad, Pops, he's here with us, we there with him, and we all know the man he was. I took a quick look at the internet, as we all do these days, and the obituary from the Chiropractic Society was, Lawrence was a committed family man, an avid golfer, and a lover of life, and a gentle, kind soul. It carries on. But that's what the man was. He had a joy de vivre for life that was beyond anyone's expectations. He kept us going. We looked forward to every trip he made. He looked forward to the trip and all his grandchildren certainly loved, loved having him here and literally the nonsense he got up to and the trouble he caused. Which he did. And he thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. From P.K. Avot, Ben Zoma says, who is wise, the one who learns from all people, he certainly sat and he learned, as you've heard from the rabbis. He was the one who got chiropractic going. He was a learner. Who is mighty? The one who subdues his evil inclination. Yes, Marty and I had a couple of conversations, and there's evil inclination in everybody. 
But as he said to you, he can't remember anything except for a soldier. Scotty, I hope your kids don't ask you that question. <laughs> <laughs> who is rich? He who rejoices in his portion. He certainly enjoyed and rejoiced in every single moment of life. I don't think we've really seen tears except that one picture that you managed to have of him and me up here. And I'm convinced that's the day Abigail said she was making Aliyah. And I think it was your birthday party or someone's party or an anniversary. And we were sitting around afterwards on Shab uh, Motsi Shabbos and he said, I want to say something. We all turned to him and said, not the right time to say you're making Aliyah now. <laughs> there were a lot of tears that day. On the bottom of an email that you received from Scott, he has a saying. Our greatest freedom is the freedom to choose our attitude. And I think that is what a lot of it is about. He instilled an attitude in you and Abigail, Peter, I don't know, which is such an attitude for life. And there's no defeatism in there. He was talking about a door being closed. My daughter Freda came home from business school on Thursday and said, Dad, look at this. And it was one of those sayings that said, when a door closes, open it. That's what doors are for. <laughs> so simple, so true. A couple of you here will remember a while ago we lost one of the Kaubach Kevra, uh, Rav uh, David Zeller from Efrat. It was the first, first funeral I've ever been to where if you remember we were standing in the parking lot and somebody started humming or singing a tune and we sang our way through that funeral as opposed to the way funerals happen what a way to go, what a way to sing he was a man who sang throughout life enjoyed song, imbued that within you and his children and please God may those merry, merry words and songs continue for the rest of your life and we may just celebrate a wonderful life. Amen. Amen. If everybody would please join us for a l'chaim, either a soft l'chaim or a hard l'chaim, for a... Aliyah, my Abba's Nisham, it would be a wonderful thing to do. And I'd like to thank everybody for being here tonight.